do you really need to do this in your business? What are the things that actually move the needle that bring in customers? And sometimes you'll be surprised. You'll realize, oh, maybe we're overstaffed. At the end of the day, being bootstrapped, uh, profitability is very important. If you're not profitable, you are asking for trouble. You can very quickly find yourself going out of business. Hey, bootstrappers, welcome to Bootstrap Stories, the podcast where founders, marketers, and thoughtful leaders share the most actionable tips on building a successful business. After meeting with hundreds of bootstrappers in the past years, I figured out that we all struggle to grow our businesses. But the truth is that most of us don't know where to ask for help or advice. That's why I decided to start this podcast, to give you all the keys to succeed at every stage of your business, all the tested strategies for solving your struggles and taking your business to a new level. No fluff, no bullshit, only a real talk between friends that help each other succeed. Today, my guest for this episode is Omar Zenom, co-founder and CEO of Webinar Ninja. Omar, welcome to Bootstrap Stories. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, G. I'm super pumped. Like, I mean, I've been following a lot what you've been doing with your podcast, with Webinar Ninja. And for those who don't know you or who might have not heard about you, can you maybe introduce a bit yourself and your business? Sure. Uh, my name is Omar Zenhom. Um, I actually was a high school and university teacher. That was my first career. That's what I did all my life for 13 years. Um, and then I moved into full-time entrepreneurship uh, in 2012. Um, and then from there, I basically uh, built a business around teaching, whether it's through podcasting, whether it's through courses, or creating a platform to allow people to teach live with webinars, which is Webinar Ninja. So uh, that's, that's a little bit about how I got started or who I am. Uh, Webinar Ninja just really is a platform that helps people uh, teach live and um, kind of uh, have all the distractions of the technology fade in the background so they could just focus on their content. Nice. And uh, how did you come up with the idea of uh, Webinar Ninja? Well, back in 2013, I was running a lot of webinars to sell my online courses and memberships. Uh, I really hated all the other pieces of software out there. Um, unfortunately, it was it actually also took a lot of pieces of software to make it happen. So at the time in 2013, the only couple of options were like go to webinar. I think they had a webinar. It was meeting or webinar. I think they had the webinar uh, feature back then and uh, Google Hangouts, which is Google Meet now. Yeah. Um, and and they took care of the video streaming part of things, which is fine. But to run a successful webinar, you need to have a good landing page. You need to have a good registration process. You need to be able to do follow-up emails and you know reminder emails. Um, and then also like the actual webinar itself was kind of hard because you had like juggle of these screens and the chat and the questions and they didn't really have great polls or any way to kind of interact with your audience really well. Uh, and then the replay was another headache where I had to kind of record it and then put it up on Vimeo. And then I had to figure out who registered for the webinar so I can only give them access to the video. So it was a lot of moving parts. So basically... <laughs> I can feel the pain. <laughs> exactly. I, but I, I loved webinars because I, as a former teacher, I love to teach online and be able to talk about my programs. And it was working for my business, meaning it would help me get sales. So I would spend two hours every week running a webinar uh, to put this all together. But then I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. So I kind of, uh, I'm a self-taught, uh, you know, very hacky PHP, uh, HTML kind of developer. I knew at the time it was still a WordPress plugin when I first version of Webinar Ninja. So I knew my way around WordPress and I, I built it around there. And I started running webinars just to make my life easier. So I have my landing page, everything's created in one place, my emails, all that stuff. Um, and my, my replay and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I started running webinars with it. My attendees started asking me, you know, what are you using for this webinar? We haven't seen something like this. And I said, oh, it's just something I put together. And they're like, can we buy it? And at that point, I never thought about getting into software. I was, you know, a course creator. I was a content creator. Um, but I thought, let me see if people are just saying this or they really need this product, if there's really a pain in the market. So I actually pre-sold the first version of Webinar Ninja. We actually opened up beta spots um, 150 spots, and it sold out in the first 48 hours. And then we opened oh. up another 100 spots that got sold out in 24 hours. 
So in that moment, I knew it was a strong enough pain for people to put money down on the promise that you know that this is going to solve their webinar worries. Uh, and the other thing is, is that like it was really ugly. The landing page was just like my mockups on Photoshop, and you know, just explaining what this thing would do. And it, I, it's so ugly, I don't even show it publicly anymore because it's so bad. Um, but it did the job. You know, it got me validation. I understood that this is something that, and it gave me some some runway capital so that I can start my bootstrap software business and hire my first engineer to clean up what I would did and sell the first version. And then after the first version was sold, uh, we were able to kind of learn from mistakes and get off WordPress and be a more typical cloud-based SaaS company. And um, yeah, so, but those first 250 members really informed the product big time and helped us uh, get off the ground. And I'm just trying to understand when it comes to the launch. So at the time you you had like uh, your audience because you were like selling courses. Uh, how many people would that be just so we get uh, an idea yeah, of, kind sure. of like the conversion? So I didn't really have a big audience. I had about a thousand people on my email list, and like it's like at the time I felt that was very little, and uh, but it took a long time for me to get a thousand. Um, uh, and I had my small community because I had just launched uh, the Hundred Dollar MBA, which was an online community to teach people how to start online businesses. Um, the answer to this question, I often give it in conferences or in interviews, and. People just don't like the answer, but it's the truth. And the truth is, is that in in January of that year, I went to a conference called the New Media Expo in Vegas. It was kind of my first entrepreneurship, kind of I'm um, now an entrepreneur kind of conference, you know. And it's the first time I met some of my heroes, some of the people that uh, you know are my colleagues today, kind of in the marketplace. You know, I, I got to meet some really interesting people on stage, and 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 I just basically just met everybody I could, got their Twitter handle, got their email. Um, and just after the conference, emailed them and said, hey, it was great meeting you. And I just tried to build some relationships at that conference. So I literally gathered like maybe like 150 contacts or something like that. Um, when it was time for me to launch Webinar Ninja, which was about four months later, I literally emailed, personally emailed every single person in my Gmail account. And, and it was an individual email. It wasn't like some sort of, you know... Uh, uh, mail merge or anything like that. I took the time. It took me like four days or something to write it down and say, hey, and, and a little anecdote and go Jets. Remember that conversation we had in the thing? And that was crazy. What happened in the lobby? Whatever. And I literally just said, hey, I'm launching this thing. I don't know if it's going to work or not. But if you think this is something that your audience would find beneficial, can you share it in your newsletter? Can you share it on social? Mm. To me, them sharing it would be more powerful than for them to buy it. I'm not, yeah. I don't really, they use it great, wonderful. And I would have like a, you know, a, you know kind of like a, a, a celebrity type of customer, great, wonderful. But for me, I really just wanted them to say, yep, this is good. Uh, I'll share in my newsletter or something like that. Of course, you know, not everybody did this. You know, I, not everybody replied to me, you know, but it's a numbers game in business. And I just, try to contact everybody I can. And by the way, like it's just good to do, get to know people and stay in touch regardless. Yeah. <laughs> um, but enough people did that to help me with my launch. And uh, I emailed my people uh, and it just got momentum. Uh, and that really helped. Nice. So if I understand correctly, it was a mix of your own audience. So people you had uh, previously like sold courses to and also yep. like uh, trying to get other people's audience from uh, existing network and uh, relationship you built in the past. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Super interesting. And uh, right now, if we move forward eight years later, like what are like kind of the, the numbers of uh, Webinar Ninja, like team size, MRR or ARR? Yeah, sure. So when it comes to, to revenue, um, we used to share our revenue in the early stages of Webinar Ninja. Um, we're a private company. We are a self-funded company. Um, we don't have any investors or anything like that. Um, but then we stopped sharing our numbers at some point. And we did this on purpose. We kind of made a intentional uh, decision not to publish these numbers on our website anymore, or talk about them in interviews, um, because we really didn't see the benefit of it anymore, um, especially because I am a member of my community. Like I am a course creator before I'm a software uh, entrepreneur. You know, I am a teacher by trade. You know, I'm actually somebody that has a teaching degree. <laughs> and <laughs> So for me, 
I always think about how does that feel for that person at some point, like in the beginning of the journey, like when you're reaching, you know, yeah, a hundred, hundred thousand uh, ARR, and then you hit, you know, two fifty, and then you hit a million, and at, at some point the numbers don't make any sense anymore. Then it's just like it, it doesn't really help the person that is reading these numbers because they really need to get off zero. That's really what they worry about. Yeah. So from from a from a um, from a revenue standpoint, we don't really share numbers, but we do have over twenty thousand users. Um, and uh, our team is about 25 people full time. We do have some part timers that come in and help us, and 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 but that's outside the 25. Uh, and our goal is really to be uh, as successful as possible, to impact as many people as possible with as little uh, of a team as possible. I, I really, it's really hard as you start growing your team to to really still have the same culture of the same kind. And I've seen different examples and the, the entrepreneurs I admire the most are the ones that can do the most with, with a, a good small team. And, uh, do you like, how do you set up these constraints? Because I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Like, uh, on my end, like, uh, I really felt kind of like the, the difference after moving like to 15, then 30 people, yeah. then 50. I mean, you have like really culture shock. And, uh, as you said, like, I think it's a, it's a challenge, like a lot of people are facing. So whenever like you started growing the company and hiring more and more people, mm. what came to your mind? Was it like, okay, this year we're not going to grow past, I don't know, like 25 or 20 people, or do you set mm. yourself like constraints or is it something you go with the flow? And if you feel like culture is strong and you have like great candidates or people applying, then you hire. How exactly do you decide? That's a good question. Um, one of the things I learned along the way, because we were actually a bigger team than this, and then we cut down a little bit because mm. um, sometimes we hire because we think we have to hire to grow, or we feel like we need a bigger team or we need people to fill these spots because that's typically what other businesses do. Um, what I found is that sometimes we... Uh, don't focus on what's working. You know, we 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 want to jump to the next thing, the next hack, the next strategy. Let's get a sales team. Let's get whatever. And, and maybe your business actually would do much better if you just focus on one target market, one uh, channel of marketing, one way of selling, one uh, whether you're going product market growth or using a sales team, whatever it is. And I feel like sometimes you have to question. Do you really need to do this in your business? What are the things that actually move the needle, that bring in customers, that get a lower churn, that help you uh, achieve your goal as a business as a whole? And sometimes you'll be surprised. You'll realize, oh, maybe we're overstaffed. Maybe we have too many people in this area. Um, and at the end of the day, being bootstrapped, uh, profitability is very important. You can't um, over. I can't overstate that because. Is if you're not profitable, you are asking for trouble because it's yeah. very quick. You can very find uh, very fast. Uh, you can very quickly find yourself going out of business because uh, you're over hiring or. Uh, and, and so, when we hire to answer your question directly, we actually look at what what is the dollar amount of revenue is this going to contribute to this hire, and if it doesn't equal the salary. Uh, and we try to actually aim for like at least 20% more than the salary because otherwise it doesn't really make sense unless it's the first hire in that department and it's going to scale later on and all that kind of stuff. But uh, then it doesn't make sense for us. Then then it makes more sense for me to take that salary of let's say 100K a year and dump it in, in a project that's already working. Like say, for example, you started a YouTube channel um, and it's going gangbusters for your inbound marketing. Triple down on that. And put a hundred grand on that. Add another content creator. Uh, run some ads for that that channel, whatever it is, and that probably will make you more revenue and grow your business more rather than just hiring somebody because okay, I think now we need a account manager because mm -hmm. this is where the business is at. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I feel like uh, <clears throat> for entrepreneurs, it's uh, it's also like uh, you know, like whenever you launch a business, you launch a business because you want to solve a problem and you like mm -hmm. kind of like new things. And there is like this uh, type of like shiny object where you always see something new coming and you want to test it and you want to try it out and you want to learn. And I do feel this is where you start hiring like more people in more departments and trying new things when yeah. actually what you said is right. Like um, the more focused you are, the better you will get. That's like mm -hmm. 100% sure. 
But again, I do, don't you feel like sometimes you might be missing on opportunities because like, I mean, obviously like you are highly profitable. Um, you have like a, a small team. So I'm assuming that revenue per employee is really high. Yeah. Um, and, and you would have like the, the money to invest it on, on new department, on testing new things. And my, my question is basically like, if you look at bigger companies, they kind mm -hmm. of started to decline because they were not innovating enough. So doubling down on something that's working is definitely like the, the best way to go and really level up. But don't you feel like sometimes you could test things in parallel rather than having like uh, your full focus? Because as an entrepreneur, your role is to delegate a lot. So mm -hmm. sometimes you can do things in parallel. Like what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I definitely, I'm a big uh, fan of experimenting, trying new things. There's a bunch of projects that we've never, we had to kill our darlings, like it didn't work <laughs> out, but some things we learned a lot of, of things throughout the process. Um, and, but that I, I personally have found in my experience, that doesn't really cost a lot of money to experiment, to MVP, to figure mm -hmm. out, to hire, like a lot of people, they think, okay, I, I want to get into YouTube and I want to, this is an example just on top of my head. I want to go full on and start a YouTube channel and create this great content and make it my marketing channel. So the first thing they think of is like, okay, let me find somebody who I can hire to do some YouTube, be the YouTube person. Mm. And, uh, and all that. like, why, why? Like first figure out if your audience will like this survey, your audience, talk to your customers, figure out what, the, what channels they're already, uh, watching. What are some content they're interested in? Hire a freelancer, uh, who's already a YouTuber, maybe someone who's in your niche already that's doing reviews on your market or whatever, like, and say, hey, can I pay you to do three videos for me uh, on these topics? Because these are the top topics that my customers are looking for. How much you want for that? Instead of me committing to a year contract with somebody, let me experiment. And it doesn't cost much money to do that. And there's, there's two other things on this topic I want to talk about. In my experience, I found that you can save a lot of money by hiring highly expensive really skilled people in certain departments. So engineering, for example, I have engineers in my experience that are probably worth five engineers. Like if I had, mm -hmm. I've hired five yeah. other engineers that don't produce the quality of work and quantity of work because this person is so highly skilled and experienced. It's just so much easier for them. So I will pay three X because I'm getting five X output, right? So more is not necessarily more hires, more bodies in the room don't necessarily equal more work. The other thing I want to say is that a lot of the work that you need to delegate as an entrepreneur, as a leader, is not super expensive hires. These are most of the work that people need to get off their plate is ten dollars tasks, admin, scheduling, email, uh, you know, customer service. All these kind of that's that's not expensive. You know, like you can. Definitely outsource that. You know, we have some really great teammates that we found in the Philippines that are a fraction of what people hire for in terms of uh, dollar amount per contract yeah. or per hire. So, uh, a lot of us, we when we when we start out, we think, okay, I need these apartments, I need these things. Do you question <laughs> question these things? And the reason why I had to question is because I'm not working with house money. I'm not working with you know, uh, an angel investor or somebody who's just dropped millions of dollars in my lap where it's like, if I don't spend it, then they're going to question me. So yeah, I think those, those are kind of the pieces of advice or the things I've learned along the way. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. And I'm hundred percent aligned with, uh, you know, like hiring highly talented people forces you like, uh, yeah, to focus, you know, on those who can bring five or 10 X, you know, like the, the work, especially with engineers. I think it's, uh, it's very true. And, you know, like the, there is this question, like, uh, for people, you know, who might be like, like listening, it's how do you find these people? Because the truth is like, you, you have like, uh, what I faced personally, and maybe you have a different experience, but what I faced is that you can have people asking for like a huge salary because they are good mm -hmm. in interview, etc. but they don't deliver. And you can have like people who are asking for a, like smaller salary and can really like deliver a lot. So do you yeah. have like tips or tricks on how to actually find these people who can do five X of the work? Yeah. So basically the question is how do I find a really good person at what they do? It's the same answer as how do I find my future wife or husband? How do I find one of the best friends I can rely on? Right. You have to track that kind of person. 
So in a way you have to sell yourself to that person because it's not only they have to sell you th themselves to you, you, you have to kind of like be the kind of company they want to work for, where they want to be excited. And that's going to take some time. I, when I got started, you know, I, there are people that I wouldn't even, uh, that I worked with and hired that I, I wouldn't consider high quality, but they were, they're good enough to get me to the next step. And as a company grows, their talent will grow with them. And I actually say this to my team. I say, hey, as a company, we are going to change. We're going to evolve constantly. We're going to improve. All of us, including me as the leader, I have to get better every day. Otherwise, we're going to be replaced, including me. Like maybe one day I'll have to get find another CEO. I can't take it to the next level because I'm not ready to improve. So the teammates that we have that have been with us for five, six years um, are people that got that message and say, I'm going to get better. I'm going to take on more challenges. I'm going to take some courses. I'm going to improve myself because if the company is going, I got to grow with it. Otherwise, we're going to have to find somebody else who's in, and this is just how it is. Um, and, and to communicate that with your team is great because then they can recommend people that know, hey, I know somebody who's good at this, this, and we have like this, we have like a referral type of bonus thing in our team to just to, to say thank you. But um, it also works in terms of your network. I really believe, uh, I'm a big believer that, you know, the people that you know, uh, the friends you make in business, it's a very small world, as you know, G. Mm -hmm. It's a very small world in SaaS, in business, and online business. So it's very important to, to, to be helpful, to be a good person, to be nice, uh, because you can reach out to your network and say, hey, I'm looking for somebody who's so-and-so. Or, hey, I know somebody who is great. One time I had a great teammate. They had to go to part-time. We needed somebody full-time. We said, okay, this person's needs part-time work. Anybody need part-time work? Yep. I need somebody. And, I, and it's a very small circle. So if you work on your network, you'll find it easy to find great talent because the best people already have jobs. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> so you really no, are. Yeah. And one of the best pieces of advice I got from Ayman Abdullah, who uh, was the president of AppSumo mm, yeah. um, is once you have product market fit, once your, your, your company is, uh, starting to make revenue. Uh, it's starting to be a well-oiled machine. You as the leaders of the company, if you or your co-founders, you're really your number one job is recruitment. You you got to find the best people to, to make your business a reality. Um, and I even recommend doing this, even if you're not hiring, you need to find great people because one day you will need to replace somebody. You will, somebody will leave, somebody will get sick, somebody, you know, there's, this is life, you know? Yeah. So that's my advice when it comes to that. Yeah, I, I really like it, and uh, Ayman is uh, is definitely like a, a great guy who doesn't get to me uh, enough. Like uh, I don't know, like uh, I think this guy is uh, is just stayed in the shadow like way too long, and actually is super smart and always give like uh, really interesting tips. So check uh, check him out. I know he's more active. He's getting more active step by step on yeah. Twitter recently. <laughs> he's a great coach too. If you ever yeah. looking for a business coach, he's fantastic. Nice. And um, I was uh, I was also wondering because um, you know we talked a lot about how focus can help you like grow and doubling down on the thing that worked. What was for you and Webinar Ninja like the the things that worked in the early days and did it change over time? Yeah, I, I would say the thing that has worked over the course of our time is basically uh, just focusing on uh, providing helpful content. Um, whether that's through our blog posts or through our guides, whether it's through our webinars itself, whether it's through our challenges, whether it's through our podcasts. Um, really, we start with the idea of like, where is our audience at? Where is our customer uh, stuck at? Where do they need to get get over a hump or have a some sort of solution? And it could be something very simple to us, but to them, it's like stopping them from you know, building their business or growing their company. It could be something like, I don't know how to set my prices. I don't know how to, you know, find my first client. I don't know how to make my first hire, whatever it is, whatever that piece of content is, we need to know what's stopping them so that we can kind of give them a win, give them relief. And for us, we found that once we actually find out what people need and then deliver it through content, it's an incredible trust building activity. It builds incredible amount of trust really quickly with your audience because they automatically see, okay, this person actually helped me uh, with a free piece of content. 
you know, there's a good chance that if I give them my money, they will uh, help me uh, even more. So uh, people really undervalue content. I think, I personally think content will never uh, kind of go out of fashion just because people always love to learn. They love, that's how they kind of convince themselves that this is the product for them. Uh, so that's number one. Um, we've run uh, on and off different types of paid advertising, Facebook, Google, all that kind of stuff. Some work, some don't, some whatever. It's very inconsistent. I got to be honest with you. And it doesn't make it easier when things are constantly changing. Mm. I don't recommend paid advertising if somebody's not making, you know, at least, uh, you know, a hundred, a hundred thousand MRR. Like it, it's not even worth you because in order for you to do it right, you need to hire somebody and to hire somebody is going to cost you five, six, seven thousand dollars Right. And then you got to pay for the ad advertising. So it's just not going to make any sense for you. And it's not going to convert for you for the first few months. And, and it's really disappointing when you're, you're really bootstrapped and you're tight. So I would recommend just focusing on one content channel, whether that's blogging or YouTube or podcasting or webinars or whatever you're doing. Uh, I'd highly recommend just focusing on a content channel in the beginning. Nice. I think that's um, that's that's really interesting because I agree with you that for ads you need a lot of uh, you know like investment. money to get started and investment. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> regarding like um, you were mentioning like content, so for me content can be divided into like organic content that people are going to really enjoy and start sharing, and also at the same time like SEO. Uh, so like optimizing keywords for search, et cetera, et cetera. Is it like something you have done both from the start or did you start it with really good content that was like shareable and bringing tons of value and then moved on to something else? We definitely do both. We definitely like definitely now because we're in such a high competitive space that we definitely have to do our research when it comes to SEO and try to figure out. Um, obviously, the content and being helpful is part number one. Then we work and find out, okay, we want to write about this. How do we find out what are the keywords? What are the things that are people searching for? What what's even if it's highly competitive, it doesn't matter for us. We we still think we can rank well because we think we can write a better piece or we can create a better piece of content. Um, so that's kind of how we work from or of an SEO side and and a, and a kind of good content and and not worry about it. I have to say, just so full transparency. We are fortunate enough to the fact that we started out very early. I mean, not very early, but 2014. And we were kind of the first webinar software to do content. So we had have the advantage of kind of really creating a lot of content early on and being indexed and um, even being backlinked a lot because of these pieces. So being early did help us. No, that's 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 interesting and again like i think you build up a lot on your audience and on the fact that you know in seo is a long-term game so as you're growing you get like a higher domain authority so each of your yep. your article can rank faster etc and it's really like a, a good uh, a, a virtuous circle let's say and yep. um we we didn't really talk about like uh, your podcast so far which uh, i think is is just crazy how many listens it gets every single day can you like give us a bit of uh, an overview yeah, on sure. why you started it, how like what it is about, and also like how do you grow it to where it is today? Yeah, so uh, the Hundred Dollar MBA Show, which is our podcast, uh, we launched it in August of 2014. But it's actually not my first podcast. I had a podcast before that that totally failed. Uh, it was an interview podcast. We ran it for a few months. It was like 46 episodes. We tried our best on a on, on a good episode. We had like 400 downloads, which is not bad. But I was trying to find my groove to build a massive audience so I can be able to serve them, help them, and then learn what they need so I can build it for them. Um, and it wasn't doing that. It was just, it was a massive failure. But I learned a lot of lessons, and the, the lessons I learned from that failure was number one. I was doing an interview podcast. There are so many interview podcasts. I really had no differentiator. And there are so many better people at interviewing than I was at the time. Uh, number two, uh, then this is kind of related. I wasn't really leveraging my strengths. Um, before I was a full-time entrepreneur, like I said, I was a full-time educator. I was a high school teacher, university teacher. I taught five classes every single day. You know, That was my bread and butter. So teaching is my super skill, really. It's my superpower. I probably am the better, the best teacher on iTunes. I would say I, I, I'm saying this in a humble <laughs> like way, this. but in terms of yeah. So for me, I was like, why am I not teaching? So 
you know, Nicole is my co-founder and the, the producer of the show. We were on a road trip from California to New York at the time, and we were discussing why is this podcast failing? And we realized, okay, maybe we need to do some teaching. And 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 we felt that in order for this to be successful, people would need to be able to not only um, understand the concept and really retain the idea, but they also to remember so they can implement. So it had to be short. So we we made 15 minute business lessons. So we actually recorded the first 10 episodes like a tr- like I would probably think I have like 50 trashed episodes because we really wanted to make sure it was a great show. Um, we launched the show in 2014, August 2014. It's a daily business lesson podcast. So every single day, somebody uh, who's a subscriber will get a new business lesson. And in uh, of December that year, we won Best of iTunes, which is a huge honor, which is just like only awarded to a dozen or so podcasts. We won it with Serial when a serial came out, as well as like startup. Um, and for us, it was just uh, th- what catapulted us in- into the next level of podcasting. Uh, we won a whole bunch of other awards along the way, but um, that allowed us to be able to gain uh, some traction and improve the show. And we have over 2,000 episodes now. It's been eight years. It's going to be eight years in August uh, of the podcast. So, really proud of that show because it's my favorite thing to do in terms of my to-do list okay. when I have to do work. <laughs> um, but also it allows me to continue to be who I am. Meaning at the end of the day, yes, I'm a SaaS founder and I'm an entrepreneur and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm a teacher. And that's why I got started in the first place and allows me to teach every day. Oh, that's awesome. So two questions for you. Uh, I mean, 2000 episodes is just like crazy. So how do you find ideas? And uh, secondly, like, do you record them in batch? How yeah. do you record them daily? So definitely I batch record. And I, I have to say, I don't do this alone. I have a team of amazing people I, on the Hunter on BA show side. Uh, Carl, our editor, and Romina, our you know, production assistant. Connor, who does all the content. Nicole, I mentioned, is a producer. We have Cindy, who does all the graphics. So like, I, I, I've gotten to the point where all I have to do is write, create the kind of the curriculum, which is the topics, and outline the episode and then record. And then the rest of the team takes care of it. So I do batch, uh, and I have to batch because otherwise I could not, I can't have a a, a vacation or a, <laughs> a holiday. Um, but I still t- I I never travel without my mic because there might be an edit I need to make or uh, a change to a sponsor or something like that. So um, it's still part of my life, which I which I accept. That's fine. Um, and uh, the the second question to that the topics. Oh, there's no there's no. Uh, problem finding topics because I'm learning so much growing my business. I, I have challenges. I, we get a lot of questions from listeners. Um, we are in touch with our own users at webinar ninja who are creators or business owners. I run a lot of webinars to find out we do polls, we do surveys. We, we, there's tons of information that we have at our fingertips. So that's never a problem. Um, really the, the challenge we, we we try to focus on is make sure that the, the all the episodes kind of make sense as you're listening to them in order so that they build upon each other. Cause sometimes you can't cover something in one shot. Like I can't cover, you know, uh, you know, ha- choosing a CRM or something like that. Like that's, yeah. that's a hard one. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and basically like did this podcast, do you think like uh, help you drive, um, traffic to webinar ninja and grow your business or do you really like split the two in, uh, Different audiences. Uh, the honest answer is I firmly believe I, I would not have my business without the podcast. The podcast uh, gave me my voice, gave me an audience, gave me a chance to learn about my audience and know what they need and what their pain points are. Um, it also allowed me to figure out in the process what kind of entrepreneur I want to be and what kind of business I want to build. Uh, you asked me earlier about the question about you know hiring and growth and 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 a lot of that has to do the, the answers to those questions also has to do what kind of business you want to have. Do you want to have a business that you um, control or the business controls you? Like and, and that's really a tough question to answer because we have ambitions and sometimes we have to make trade offs. We have to say maybe I want to be able to stop working at six o'clock and have time with my family and maybe have a, a vacation once a year. Does that equal a business that grows at all costs? Of course not. That, that You can't have both. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's what that, just the, 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 
the exercise of learning and growing and teaching on the podcast and also the consistency. This is the number one thing I learned is that just being consistent, doing something every single day, regardless of how you feel or if you want to do it or not, or if it's doing well or not, or whatever the reaction from the crowd, or if you have reviews or you didn't get any reviews today or whatever, doing it regardless that builds a lot of character. It, it allows you to get better, allows you to find your voice and be a better public speaker and be a better presenter, a better teacher. So uh, anything you do consistently, it's just it's just math. You're going to get better. Yeah, I agree with that. I think like whenever you get started at doing something, you should focus on the output rather than the outcome. It's like uh, the oh yeah, start for like 60 days and do it daily. And no matter what happens, you know, like just do it daily. And as you said, you yeah. get better and... Uh, and again, like every single day you do it, it's like another day where someone else is just like stopping, you know, their streak. So you yeah. you are beating up on uh, on a lot of people. <laughs> Some people, you know, they ask me like, you know, how are you able to kind of keep going and still be successful as a podcast? And I, and my answer is just that is I just outlasted people. So there's so many podcasts <laughs> that launched when I launched that they're not allowed. They don't publish anymore. It, it, sometimes you just keep going and and you just uh, you stay alive. Yeah, staying alive. That's like the <laughs> the, the motto for bootstrapping. <laughs> yeah. Stay alive longer. And um, I, I want to now, you know, like uh, start talking because you create a lot of content. You're like an awesome teacher. You do like uh, really cool things with, with your podcast. And I want to like give tons of value to our audience with uh, how to create webinars. Why, why are you using webinar or why should you use webinar? So for someone, you know, who wondering like, okay, what can webinar drive me? Like, how do I get started? What would mm -hmm. you say? So the one thing I would say is anytime you buy anything, if you want somebody to buy your product, you have to think about how does anybody buy anything? And if you buy anything, at the end of the day, somebody makes a decision in their head that whatever that thing is that you're selling to me is more valuable or as equal valuable to the money that you're going to part ways with. So to get to that point, there's a lot of steps involved, right? And there's big companies spend thousands and thousands of dollars every single second of the day, right? Millions of dollars on Super Bowl ads, on, on advertising, on bus ads, on, on uh, affiliates, on all this stuff. They try to do to get you aware of their business and to say, hey, you should buy this thing because you're going to really not regret it. You're going to love it. Webinars for small businesses fast tracks that. It allows you to build trust very quickly because it allows your audience, the person on the webinar, to quickly see your value and see that, hey, this person actually cares about me and has my best interest in mind. So in, in about a 30 minutes to an hour, they can learn about who you are, why you started your business. They can learn what's in it for them, why they should buy your product. They could take a look at it. They can make some really hard, you know, decisions that they're hard outside of a webinar because there's no back and forth, there's no questions, there's no way for them to see things visually or hear things. You know, it's very stagnant on a sales page. So what I love about webinars is that it's interactive. It gives you a chance to showcase who you are. And at the end of the day, if you're an independent business, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a creator, if you're a coach, they're really buying you. They're buying. Does this person get to deliver? And actually, the webinar gives you an audition, gives you a chance for them to see. They give their name, they give their email address, they give their time for free, and you show them what you got. And in exchange, you build trust. And that's, I haven't seen anything convert better. So, one, it's a great way for you to make sales. Um, and it's the way I built my businesses for the last 10 years. Uh, but on top of that, um, a lot of our customers, you know, they don't only use it to sell their product, but to deliver their product, to be able to give paid workshops, to be able to deliver masterminds and coaching and all that kind of stuff. And the thing is that we've learned, especially now recently, there's a big trend on live learning is just that people want some interaction. People want to go back and forth. Uh, one of the studies that we found is that the completion rates for recorded courses are 4%. 4%! Yeah, it's versus terrible. a live, yeah, versus <laughs> a live course is over ninety percent because people need accountability. People need to have a time and a place to show up. It's very similar to like school when we were kids or going to university. You know, you have to kind of, you know, you have your other friends telling you, "Hey, let's go." And when you have a cohort of people, uh, it's easier to accomplish things. There's safety in numbers. 
Um, so this is why it's quite effective. Um, and a lot of people love running live webinars on live events and, and, and workshops. Um, and, uh, they choose our tool just because they find it, it's, it's easy to use and it's, uh, works well with their workflow with their business. And do you feel like um, as like um, a starting business or a business growing, like what should be the, the frequency at which you're doing like a webinar? So with a lot of our users, what we, we tell them to do is, you know, the first webinar is the easiest one because all you got to do is just do an open Q&A. You don't mm -hmm. even need to prepare. You don't have to do anything. People have questions about your product. It could be very simple questions like, do you take Amex? You know, <laughs> you know, do you have a payment plan? Do you, uh, does this work on Mac when it's a browser based, you know, like whatever, yeah. but they, you don't know your user that yeah. what level they're at. So, um, a lot of our users, the first webinar we do is just open Q and a, there's no slides needed. They just take questions. They get to know each other. They can share their story. And it's just a nice, uh, genuine way for you to share who you are in your business with other people. Um, from there, what I love about starting with a Q and a is, you can save all the questions that you get from the webinar and those become your next topics because people are going to ask questions like, well, how do I, you know, create this? How do I start? What do I do? I have this problem. These are all big pain points. And with our software webinar Ninja, you can upvote questions so that, you know, the attendees can upvote questions. So then you can see what are the really hot topics. Okay. There's 10 upvotes with this question. This should be the title of my next webinar. So, uh, and then from there, you can give great value. We have, most of our users do live webinars every two weeks because they allow time to fill the webinar. Uh, and they run an automated webinar to grow their email lists and to be able to feed that live webinar as well. So the automated webinar is usually something like kind of a self-serve thing, like maybe like a demo or uh, um, maybe some great content to get them started or maybe some case studies. Um, and it's kind of on demand and people can watch that. And uh, we offer both types. Nice. And what would be for you like, um, like the perfect structure of a webinar? So... We mentioned Q&A to get like the ideas. I really love that. I think it's a great tip. And then after that, let's say like uh, you want to run a webinar, like how long should it last? Mm -hmm. How should it be structured? How do you make catchy enough so people actually interact? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, this was such a big topic that we created a guide called uh, uh, the webinar topic formula, which allows people to know how to create because the, the title of your webinar is very important because it's what makes people register. Um, and my general advice on this, and like the one thing if you're going to take away from that guide is you got to try to be as specific as possible because at the end of the day, your title is your promise. If you don't fulfill your promise by the end of the webinar, if I say to you, uh, you know, join this webinar, it's all about how to become an amazing basketball player. That's too wide of a promise. I can't, you know, <laughs> fulfill that. In a, in a, in, but if I said to you how to improve your free throw shooting by 5%, I can show you some things that you can work on that can get you there. It's specific. It's mm -hmm. very niche. Um, and it just deals with free throw shooting, not every facet of basketball. So uh, specific is very important for your topic. Um, and I like to say in the beginning of the webinar, in the chat, uh, I usually pin this in the top of the chat. Uh, I ask our audience, and I actually do this too in the email notifications leading up. I say, hey, uh, let me know in the chat right now at the start of the webinar, uh, what would be a win for you today? What are you trying mm -hmm. to gain? If there's one thing you can get out of this today's webinar, why did you sign up? What are you looking for? And people just start chatting. And one of the reasons I do this is that it's a softball question. It allows people to get interaction. And it, you have to train your audience to engage. You can't just be like, come on, guys, talk in the chat. Like, you know, like this is something <laughs> I learned in teaching. You can't just expect students to do things. You have to train them. You have to say, this, when I do this, you do this. When I, You have to prompt them. So that way... By the time you get to the middle of the webinar, end of the webinar, when you start talking about your product and services and things like that, they're already engaged. You're asking questions or asking buying questions, things like that. So I start with what would be, what would be a win for you today? Um, and then I just read them out. I say, okay, so Caroline says she wants this and you know, Roger says this and VJ says that. And I, I talk about it. And what's great about this is that now when I do my demo, when I look at, when I show my product, I don't show every feature because that's going to cause overwhelm. I only show the features that solve the problems they say. So mm. now I'm selling without them knowing because really I'm just answering their question. Hey, VJ, you said that um, I, do I do I need to create a separate landing page or do I have to you know buy another service? 
Well, I'm glad you asked that question because we have built-in landing pages. Let me show you how it works. Da, 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 da. So I'm answering this question, but at the same time, I'm showing the part of the software or the of my product. This could work for courses or training or whatever that solves that problem. You know, like snowboard instructor. Uh, I really get nervous when I get off the the slope or something or off the chair. Oh, great! We have a special module just talking about getting off the chair safely. Let me show you what it's all about. And that way. They know I can learn more by buying your product. And at the same time, they don't get overwhelmed by all the features and bells and whistles. As founders, sometimes we're very proud of our product. We go overboard. <laughs> a bit too much sometimes. <laughs> yeah, a bit too much. I always like some time to answer questions, of course. And then just to wrap up as one more tip is at the end of the webinar, you need to ask your audience, did you get a win today? The reason mm. why this question is important is because... Uh, I actually, it's a two part. I said, did you get a win today? If yes, tell me what your number one takeaway was, right? So then they, what this does is number one, it automatically confirms in their head, okay, this was a good webinar. I got value. I wrote, yes, I'm not a liar. This So automatically it makes them feel like this is a win. Yeah. Number two, it requires them to remember what they learned and choose their favorite thing. So therefore they remember the lesson. So it's kind of like a recap, like, okay, what was your number one takeaway? We talked about these five things. Which one was your number one? Oh yeah. Or I say, which one do you want to work on first? Which thing you're going to do? Which webinar are you going to create today? So it makes them think about, okay, these are the things we did. This is my favorite one. I'm going to pop it in the chat. Um, and this just allows them to understand that, okay, that's the next step. This is not the end. The webinar is at the end. We still have more things to do after this. Um, and that was really powerful because it allows people to feel like they got a win. They actually accomplished. And it, it seals that deal of, I can trust this person. They actually delivered. No, I, I really like like all your tips. I think it's uh, it's awesome. Love the the tips at the end because it's it's very true. And the more I think, the more you have people interact, and the more you have people actually writing things, the stronger the bond you've created. And uh, and that's super important whenever you want to sell something that I think can uh, also be beneficial in the at the very beginning of the webinar. Um, it's to have like whenever you have a slide. Is to or it's something we've tried and I feel like uh, the the engagement was a bit higher afterwards. Is uh, I usually know who is my target audience, so I know like people are either working as entrepreneur, either working in sales or marketing. So I just say like type in the chat if you are one if you are entrepreneur, two if you're sales, and three if you're like a marketer. That way people just have to say one, two, or three. Yeah, it's easier for them just to get started, and after that you can start with a. Uh, Another question that's more open, but uh, yeah, I, I love yeah. I love all your tips. I love this tip. This is great, and and have fun with it, guys. Like one of the things I do is, you know, I I, I like to stop every five or ten minutes and just check in with them. Like, say, hey, how's it going? Like, if you've got value from this webinar so far, give me a fire, give me an emoji, nice. give me something, you know, and just and you don't have to be super buttoned up about it. You can just say like, if you don't like it, give me a thumbs down or whatever. And then and when they give you a thumbs down, okay, I'm blocking John now. And they're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> no, John, I no, love that. just kidding. <laughs> and <laughs> poor John. <laughs> yeah. And, and what's usually like the, the time frame between each interaction you have, like, uh, would that be every 10, 15 minutes or do you, do you plan it or do you not plan it? Do you just do it as you go or like, so this is a technique I learned from my teaching days and teacher trainer is the, if you look back at you, if I say this to you, it's going to make sense because you're going to remember your own grade school teachers probably did this, but it's a method called input, output, input, output. And the method is, is that I only give the next input after the students give me output. So for example, if I say to you, uh, you know, um, Let's let's uh, learn how to snowboard. The first thing we're going to learn how is to put on your uh, your gear. So step one is okay. You're going to put your boots into the snowboard. You're going to put your front foot first, okay, and then you're going to put your back foot first. Before I move on and talk about what the next step is, I say that's step one. Which foot we're going to put first? We're going to put front foot first, then mm. back foot. You get the you get output that you have to see in the chat, or you get them on camera, or whatever, and you get them to output the answer. Don't just move on until you confirm they learned this part. Okay, you got it? Great. Let's move it on to step two, step three. And you do that. Before you move on to step three, you get output. You know, like, okay, step two, uh, we're going to learn how to stand up on the board. You can either use toe side or heel side. Okay, so one of the ways we do it, we get on our knees, we push ourselves up, and we get up. What do we do? Get on our knees, we get them to repeat it. Get them to, and number, 
the other thing I found that this is great is that it gets people to pay attention because they see the pattern. They're like, oh, I want to get the answer right. And they don't go to Facebook. They don't go to other sites. They're mm-hmm. focused on your, on your session. No, uh, this is this is awesome. So many like uh, value boom in the <laughs> in the last ten minutes. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, like to make a, a webinar, like either on the conversion part or maybe like invite part? Like what what are like what would be your tips like for maybe better conversion or getting more people to join uh, your webinar? This is really good. Um, so the number one thing I have found that has worked the most this is going to sound really, really weird and very basic, but it's literally walking them by the hand and showing them how to sign up. Mm-hmm. Literally, you can put screenshots on your slides. When you click this button in the offer, you're going to see this page. And when this page, you're going to fill in this form. Once you fill in this... So the thing is, is that why is this effective? Some people think, oh, because you're giving them instructions and helpful and they can see what's going to happen. Yes. But really, the reason why it's effective is because they're imagining already signing up. And once you don't really do anything unless you picture in your head first. For Mm -hmm. example, the last vacation you went on, before you bought the tickets, before you booked the hotel, in your heads at some point, you imagined yourself sitting on the beach in Nice or whatever it is. You know, like you're, you're just thinking, Okay, something's going on here. I went to Ansi and then I saw the canals, I saw the beautiful boats and everything. Okay, great. But you have to imagine it first. And you got to help them imagine it by showing them these are the steps. And they're going to sign up and you're going to get this confetti thing once you sign up and you're going to go validate your email once you're there. This is the thing you're going to see onboarding. It's going to walk you by the hand to create your first webinar. The reason why this is important is to show them what happens when they sign up is because they also have a little bit of anxiety. I don't know if I can do this. This is going to be hard. So you show them the first step. This is not hard. We walk you by the hand. We actually show you step by step how to do the first thing. When I was, you know, I was creating my courses, I always have an orientation course, which just says, hey, here's the, the first course you're going to take is orientation course. Forget about the content. Right now, we're going to talk about this is where you find your lessons. This is where you chat with everybody else. This is the Slack group, you know, and it just gets people feeling, okay, cool. This place is organized. I, I can do this. That's what you got to do. And doing that before, like after you do your pitch and you say, okay, this is how much it's going to cost. And this is the money back guarantee. Da, da, da. Let me show what's going to happen when you sign up. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and it just makes things a whole lot easier. I, I love that. Again, like everything starts in, uh, in your mind. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's very true. And uh, yeah, I mean, what was like for you, like on the, the frequency of the webinar, what have you found like being the the top version let's say like you have a software should you do like webinar on a weekly basis um should you do it like uh, twice a month how do you make sure that you have people joining should you pre-record your webinar and then come to just answer questions like what are the tips you could give like uh, to someone running like a SaaS company for example so if you're running a SaaS, um all our SaaS clients like what we found that is most effective is they run weekly because mm-hmm. they use our make presenter feature, which basically they just bring everybody on camera that's there and they have smaller groups. So they have like a group of maybe five to 10 uh, customers. And even if it's less than five, it's even better because they get more attention. Um, and uh, what they, if you have a freemium, if you have a free plan, you can actually get them to uh, go into their account. You can show them how to create whatever you do in your software. Uh, you know, uh, how to get started, all that kind of stuff. And, and then you can take control as well and show your screen and, and give your presentation. So weekly is really good because you can have a small intimate group. You can get people on camera, you can get hot seats and coach them and help them out and get them started. Um, and then there's something about um, having a group and it's small and everybody knows each other. And then when you say, okay, I have this offer for you guys. If you want to get started today, here's the offer. Once usually there's always one person that's going to buy because they're just on the call, really the demo to just answer, ask a couple questions or just have an excuse to buy. Like, okay, I know now (laughs) everything I need to know. I'm going to buy. And that encourages other people. And somebody sees it. Okay. And you know, George pipes up and says, Oh, I'm ready to sign up. I'll take that offer. And then other people will sign up as well. Mm. Oh, this person's not a better business owner than I am, you know, whatever it is. And it does announcing winners is really or announcing buyers really is effective i even do it with larger webinars where um we tell them hey if you want the bonus 
when you sign up during the webinar, put in uh, the uh, chat uh, hashtag Ninja Life. And mm. then when they see hashtag Ninja Life, everybody kind of sees, oh, it encourages other people to try it as well and give it, get it going. And of course, if you have a, some sort of risk reversal trial or money back guarantee, that helps. Nice. That's uh, that's super great. So I, I want to be like uh, cautious of uh, of your time. Um, <laughs> we usually wrap up like uh, the bootstrap stories with like three fire questions. Sure. The first one being like, uh, what's your uh, favorite favorite book or podcast that you recommend to another bootstrap uh, entrepreneur? Oh, beside my own podcast, Hundred Dollar MBA Show, <laughs> the Hundred Dollar MBA Show. Um, no, I'll go with the book. Uh, my favorite book is shoe dog by phil knight it's the autobiography of uh, phil knight who's the founder of nike uh it just shows you what you have to be willing to do and go through to be successful in business it's it, it really is sobering and i really love his story uh, crazy door to door sale for so many years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talking about consistency there yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second question is, uh, who's uh, the, the bootstrap entrepreneur that you follow and admire the most? Uh, I'm going to tell him I said this. I, I, I'm in love with John O'Nolan. I love John O'Nolan. I love what he stands for. I love what he does. He's the founder of Ghost, uh, ghost.org, which is a great platform if you were looking to build memberships, blog posts, uh, a blogging platform or um, a newsletter or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. John O'Nolan, um, it's a non-for-profit, but it's, he's a bootstrap business owner. Uh, I just love his philosophy on business and life. I had a chat with him recently and um, I got to get to know him as a friend. We, we were at the same conference a few years ago and uh, we just became fast friends. And um, I, 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 would, I would encourage people to just like go on a binge and listen to a bunch of interviews of John O'Nolan just because um, he has a good balance of ideas of being successful in life and in business. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, what uh, is the one thing you do uh, to regain energy during tough times? Ah, that's a good question. Exercise is great. So everybody says, I have no time for exercise. It gives you time. It does. It gives you energy. I love just going to the gym, putting an audio book on and just being my me time. I use the philosophy of... Uh, um, Scott Adams, who's the guy who does the Dilbert cartoons, but he has this great book. He talks about like some of us, we, we, we say, Oh, I got to go to the gym so I can get in shape or lose weight or things like that. I'm, I, I take his philosophy, which is like, I go to the gym because what do healthy people do? They go to the gym. I want to be a healthy person. I'm just doing it. Like you said, the habit, as soon as I walk through the door of the gym, I won done. I'm at yeah. the gym. It doesn't <laughs> matter if I do my max bench or if I don't do it, whatever. It's just the consistency that matters. So I love exercise. I love playing basketball. It's my favorite sport of all time. Um, I play basketball just for fun in the league for, you know, 40 plus year old guys that, you know, can't play anymore. Uh, but uh, it just, it's good to get the blood pumping and moving mm. around and feeling uh, human again. Nice. I love it. Well, Omar, thanks a lot. Um, where can people actually like follow you, get your updates uh, and uh, check out Net Webinar Ninja? Sure. Um I am not very active on social. I, I This is one of the sacrifices I make just because I, I want a, a bit of time and peace for myself. But uh, the one social platform I'm most active on is Twitter, and I'm at the Omar Zinhome there. Uh, you can look up our podcast, $100 MBA show, or check out Webinar Ninja at webinarninja.com. Awesome. Thanks a lot for uh, joining on the show, Omar, and uh, have an awesome day. You too. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Bootstrap Stories, the only podcast where bootstrap entrepreneurs share their journey in all transparency. If you enjoyed this episode, don't hesitate to leave us a review. And in case you want to see the interview, all episodes are live on the YouTube channel. Check out the link in the description and hit subscribe if you haven't already. Have an amazing day and make sure to also join us in our amazing Bootstrap community where we all helped each other to become successful and grow a profitable business. Take care and talk to you soon. <laughs>